Tonight, we will be privileged to hear from founder and president of Camp Chef Incorporated, Ty Meesom. Ty graduated from Utah State in 1987 with a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering. In 1990, while working at a fabrication company here in Logan, Ty recognized an opportunity in the, out in the outdoor retail cooking industry to start a business. The business Ty created was Camp Chef. And for the last two and a half decades, Camp Chef has changed the way people feed their friends and family while camping, tailgating, and at their homes. Camp Chef began by creating high-capacity propane stoves that were both portable and powerful, and since then has created hundreds of other products and accessories. Ty, in his free time, loves to enjoy spending time with his wife, Sue, and their five children. Please welcome me in, joining, in welcoming Ty. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> this is kind of a new experience for me. I normally don't like to get up in front of people and, and uh, especially talk about myself or business, so I'm not going to do very much of that uh, tonight. But I uh, want to express thanks to the, the uh, entrepreneurs group, and I've had a great visit with Andy and for his uh, uh, you know, invitation to come speak with you and uh, uh, your leadership group. and. Uh, Mike Glauser, a nice visit with him. What a great program you guys have and what a great opportunity to, you know, learn about business and get experience with business and, and what great facilities that you have here. So it's great, a great experience. You guys should feel blessed uh, uh, because not everybody gets this kind of an opportunity. <clears throat> so what I'll do tonight is maybe share with you a little bit about Camp Chef and how we got started and... and uh, uh, Maybe there's some life lessons there and, and share some stories with you. I mean, I'm, I'm a big believer that uh, uh, story is the fabric of life and, and we learn through stories and that's really the best way to learn. And so I'll share some stories with you tonight that will maybe help you uh, think a little different about business and, and maybe about the things that you want to do with your life and with your education. Um, so to start with, it, is ever, who, who hasn't cooked on something that's Camp Chef? We're not doing a good enough job then, are we? So hopefully everybody is, at least here, is familiar with Camp Chef. And, and you can see here a lot of the products that we do. Um, kind of the secret of Camp Chef is that we have, have built a, a basic, you know, stove system. <clears throat> Sorry. And, and, and then have built an accessory system on top of that so that you can take a two-burner stove and if you want to do griddle and flat-top cooking, you can, or barbecue cooking, or Dutch oven cooking, or... Uh, you know, a few years ago, uh, we put a, a pizza oven in our backyard, and, uh, you know, but, but it cost about $10,000. And I said, there's got to be a way to do that. And so, you know, I, I spent a month, and we designed up a pizza oven down here that sits on top of our stoves that cooks just like a, a, a brick oven pizza. And so, again, something fun to do. And so build products like that, you know, on top of this core Camp Chef system. And people say, you know, what's kind of the secret of Camp Chef? Well, really, that is. It's, it's taking a, a, a single product, building a lot of products on top of that, and then pushing that into multiple channels. So in, in a nutshell, with the introduction, you know, that's kind of Camp Chef. And, um, you know, I didn't think I'd have enough to say, and now I think I've got about three hours worth of stuff to say, Mike, so I don't know. It's, it's hard. So... Um, just quick, ed educational experience. I, I started my university career at the University of Utah in mining engineering. And uh, in 1984, got married and thought, you know, I want to do something a little different than that. We came up to Utah State, got in the mechanical engineering program, and uh, I've just stayed. We love Logan and, and uh, uh, found good educational opportunities here in Cache Valley. Uh, I started my career at Icon Health and Fitness back in the, the late 80s. It was Westlow. And that's where I really, you know, cut my teeth in learning about products, about product design, uh, in a very fast-growing business, and was just a great experience to, to uh, be there and, and learn more, than there, more there than it could have probably any place else in the country working. And in 1990... I got the opportunity to go work for a company here in town called Dutro Company. A lot of people don't know Dutro Company or that business, but they've been in town for over 40 years. 
They're a metal manufacturing company. Build material handling equipment, carts, dollies, and equipment like that. And uh, Bill Dutro, who's the owner of Dutro Company, I had worked with him uh, through Icon because he had done a lot of contract manufacturing, parts and pieces and metal stamping. And some people had approached Bill about building some barbecues. He'd been introduced to them through the Chamber of Commerce here in Logan. And uh, Bill said, well, I need some help if I want to add a new product line and like these, you know, kind of outdoor barbecues. And so he asked me to come on board and head up this group to build these barbecues. Well, it's really kind of a classic, you know, uh, lemonade from lemon story. I flew down to California to meet with these guys and... And within a couple of hours, we realized that it just, there really wasn't anything there. And later we found out that it was really kind of a scam. And they had already taken three or four other groups of investors. And Bill lost about $250,000. And I came back to Logan. And a few weeks, we realized there just wasn't anything there. But out of that genesis of the business, we'd ended up a box full of parts. And we had some burners. And we had uh, you know, some, some valves and some odds and ends. And I had been interested in Dutch oven cooking, and Dutch oven cooking is something that's popular here in Cache Valley. So over the course of a couple of months, I put together a couple of products, a two-burner stove, which is kind of the genesis of this stove right here, and a single-burner stove, and uh, said, well, I think we've got a couple of products. And, you know, kind of uh, talked to some people around the valley, and. And, and said, well, is, is there a market for this? And really at that point was just, you know, an engineer, I've got to put my salesman's hat on and, and go out and figure out how to sell a product. And, you know, so really in, in the, the story of Camp Chef, and what I'd like to do is kind of tell that, tell Camp Chef's story in, in uh, a, a series of stories about mutually beneficial relationships. And I've never used a PowerPoint like this, if you can believe that, but we'll try tonight. So here's a quote. So before the internet and Wikipedia, uh, there was Will and Ariel Durant who basically wrote a history of the world. So if you guys don't know who they are, you can look them up on Wikipedia. So this is a great quote from him. So the first biological lesson of history is that life is competition. Competition is not only the life of trade, it is the trade of life. Peaceful when food abounds, violent when the mouths outrun the food, animals eat one another without qualm, civilized men consume one another by due process of law. That's a great quote. And you're all familiar with competition, because it is. It, it's competitive to be here at the university. And some of you are, are going to be teachers or engineers or lawyers, and you want to get into medical school. Well, that's a competitive thing. And competition is a way of life. But what I want to balance that with is this idea of mutually beneficial relationships. Because if we just live in a competitive world and consume each other, it's not a very good world to be in. But if we develop mutually beneficial relationships, then, you know, we actually can have a successful and a good life. So, really, for me and Camp Chef, the first beneficial relationship was with Bill Dutro. And coming on board and participating with him and having the opportunity and the support to, to go out and build a business. Now, the second beneficial relationship in building Camp Chef was with a, a, a man named Joseph Liu, who I met when I was at Icon. Uh, he was from Taiwan, and he had moved to Portland, and he had started basically a, a, an import business. And eventually, he became my partner in Camp Chef. But at the time when I first met him, we were, uh, uh, you know, sourcing parts from him. And, and at this point, I just want to share, there's, there's Camp Chef is kind of a microcosm in a bigger story. It's an interesting story, but the bigger story is, is we're seeing being played out right now in the pol politics of our country in the economics of our country, and in the social aspects of our country. And it's a big story. It's a story that got our current president elected. And that story starts in the global sourcing network, or really, you know, the, the rise of that in the early 90s. 
So really, the first stove that we ever built, we manufactured here in Logan, but I used burners that were sourced from China, and I had regulators that were sourced from Mexico. And so from day one, in 1990, we were a global source business, but about 95% made in the U.S., and we sourced, you know, globally there. And, and really, that's one of the biggest driving forces of our economy of really the last, you know, 25 years. And every economic revolution, you know, produces winners and losers. And, you know, we're seeing some of that now, and that's playing out currently in our politics. And so Camp Chef is kind of a microcosm. As we go through, I'll talk just a little bit about that. So there's two mutually beneficial relationships. That, that the first tied to building here with Bill Dutro and Dutro Company. The second is, is tied with, you know, this global supply chain. And a global su supply chain really rose to meet you know, what became a, a really kind of a ma the mass merchant, mass merchant uh, retailing, you know, which is, everybody knows is manifested through Walmart. And, and how do you supply a national and international business like Walmart with goods and services? And we see that at Camp Chef, we see that at Icon, we see that, that type of uh, supply chain to service, service that business um, you know, again, played out in our economy. Now, <clears throat> see where I'm at. So, in any business, and you guys are, are learning how to start a business and participate in it, and, and the key thing, and you know this, is that you don't do that by yourself. And so, I've mentioned two positive, you know, uh, uh, beneficial relationships. But, so, but I'll just go through a few more here because it's instructive. So who wants a Frisbee? Anybody? Let's see, up there. There's one. There's one. Way back there. All right, so here's the, here's the brand, Camp Chef, right there. So after we figured we got a product, I came home and I sat down with my wife and I said, we got to have a name. So we spent a couple of hours or a couple of days trying to figure out what to call this business. And we came up with Camp Chef. And so what did I do? I called uh, my friend. Her name was Deb Calderwood. She was the, one of the industrial designers down at Icon. And I says, Deb, you know, I've got this product. We're going to call it Camp Chef. Will you come up with a logo for me? So Deb spent a little time and she came up with a logo and there's the logo. And we've kept the same logo with minor changes. We increased the size of the flame about 10 years ago so we could have an icon. But, but we've stuck with the logo. Point being, you know, use the resources around you, the relationships that you have, and when you come up with a good name, stick with it. Okay? Don't be changing that brand. Stick with it. Okay? So there's three. Um... that I put. Okay, the next thing with the product, and then there's the questions. How do we sell it? What do we do with it? How do we get this out in the marketplace? So again, and you get it, hold in your, hold in your heads here that this is pre-cell phone, pre-internet, pre-any of that, and so you just got to go out to your local network. And so at that point, I reached out to the people in the community that I knew. You know, I talked to the people at IFA and at Cal Ranch. And one of the key relationships, I talked with uh, Chris Larson down at Al Sporting Goods. Anybody here work at Al Sporting Goods or have in the past? Some up there, some up there. Well, see, as you guys know, Al Sporting Goods and Chris Larson has one of the best independent sporting goods stores in the nation. And, you know, it hasn't been easy for independent anybody's stores the last few years and competing on the web, but they're an example of somebody who has engaged the web engages their customers and is running a really successful business. So back in about 91 or 92, I went and talked to Chris Larson and said, do you think you can sell this product? And he says, I think I can sell it. And so we put a few there. But the networking is, is that Chris Larson and his store, they belong to a national buying group. That buying group consists of maybe 500 stores like 
uh, Al's Sporting Goods. And so I called and got an invitation to their trade show, which they do twice a year, and went down to that trade show, and, and we can buy a booth, and then we set up, and we then sell to 500 Al Sporting Goods with the idea, well, if it works for them, it will work for a sporting goods store in New York or a sporting goods store in California. And so again, that's a, a taking, again, a mutually beneficial relationship, going out to these stores and, and then building the business that way. And then at that first show that I went to, it was in Texas, um, that's where I met national sales reps and, and made great friends with them. And some of those reps that I met 25 years ago still work for us today. And again, another mutually beneficial relationship. And they call on, you know, some of the bigger accounts and they help you grow the business. So, again, so you guys reach out to those, those networks and now you have the internet to reach out, you know, even more broadly with them. I mean, again, just another story. I, even at that time, Cabela's was, you know, one of the premier stores and catalogers, you know, in the country. And, and I was scared to death to pick up the phone and, and call Cabela's and ask for the buyer for our category because you don't think, well, I'm nobody. How can, I, how can I call them? And I find, well, I'll give them a call. And you pick them up and you go through a couple of different people and you finally get to the buyer on the phone and, and you describe the product. And they were great guys. And they said, well, sure, send me out some information. We'll look at that. And uh, then later went out to Cabela's. Great people, great relationships. You know, the point is... You know, you got to make the call. If you don't make that call, nothing happens. So put yourself out there, and even though you might get rejected, but, you know, make the call. Um, I'm going to tell you one more story just, just with that, and this is going to these various trade shows. And I don't know how we're doing on time. Some of will have to, 628. So uh, the first trade show that, that I went to, uh, probably in about 1991, was a catering show. And again, caterers, they need, you know, portable cooking equipment. This show was down in Dallas and went to the show and, a, and kind of a friend of a friend said, this may be a show that you should go to. And set up our booth and uh, uh, wasn't a big show and, you know, these different caterers from around the country would come to it. There was this guy, his name was Tom Durr and the name of his company was Big John Outdoor Catering and he was a big guy. And he came by the booth, and he wore a gold-plated skillet frying pan around his neck. <laughs> okay? Big chain, this big bling like that, and he was a big guy, big gregarious guy. And, uh, and he came by, and he says, tell me about that stove. We had a two-burner stove like we had there. And I told him about the stove, and, and he said, we can use that in our business. I want 100 of them. First or biggest order that we ever had, 100 stoves here from Tom Durr at Big John's. And he was back on the East Coast. He was uh, based in Massachusetts. And uh, uh, great order and, and came back. And basically myself, we set up the line, built those stoves and got him to him. And that was the first big order that we've got. And consequently, I, and, and they're still a dealer 25 years later. He passed away a few years ago, but his daughter and son-in-law continue to run that business. But another show, I asked him, I says, Tom, I says, why do you wear that great big thing around your neck? And he says, I'll tell you why I wear it, because the very reason that you just asked me about it, and that's the very reason that I throw these out, because you'll remember that. You know what I mean? Throw those Frisbees out. See, this kid down here is saying, I wish I'd have gotten one of those Frisbees. I want one. <laughs> See that? <laughs> but, but you'll remember the brand, and that was the whole point. That was, that was his thing, and everybody knew him, and... And, and he wore that big gold frying pan at all the trade shows. And when he walked around, you knew that was Tom from Big John's, and, and, and that's what he did. Okay, now one more story along with that at another show. And uh, uh, we, we've got time. I'll, there's, there's a couple of lessons here. So uh, maybe 10 years ago, I was at an industry conference for the outdoor industry, and I met Sally Jewell. Anybody know who Sally Jewell is? You do? Okay, here's your other tip. You guys, you need to read the Wall Street Journal at least three times a week so you know what's going on in the world. Be reading good things all the time. I tell my kids, always be reading a good book and be reading a national newspaper all the time. 
So Sally Jewell was the CEO of REI for a number of years, smart lady. And uh, she was the latest secretary of the interior, which is again another big job, secretary position, for about the last, I think, five years until the new administration came in. Anyway, I was at an industry conference and uh, it was some kind of reception and, and I got visiting with her and, and, and she said, what do you do? And I said, well, we're, we're camp chef. And she says, oh yeah, we sell camp chef stuff and REI is a good customer and, and uh, we visited and, and, and talking about business. And she says, well, keep things fun. I mean, her key thing was you've got to make camping of the activities fun. And, and we talked about products that make that fun. And then she said this. She said their biggest challenge that she was working on was to make sure that REI was accessible, an accessible place to shop for everybody. See, now what does that mean? See, REI is a specialty sporting goods store. And she felt like it wasn't accessible to minorities or people in a certain socioeconomic station. They didn't feel like they could walk into an REI. It was too upscale or it was too specialized. And so she was trying to do things that, that, that made the doors to REI open to everybody. You know, the, the movie version of that is uh, Ryan Gosling in the, what the, the, whatever movie that was, where, where he looks at Steve Carroll and he says, you're better than the gap. Right? You remember that line in there? And so, you know, Sally Jewell, she's trying to say, you know, you're, you're, you're better than buying your sporting goods at Walmart. You know, you can walk into, say, REI and buy them. So, you know, and I've really thought about that. You've got to make sure your, your products are accessible. I mean, you know, there's luxury goods and there's different things, but make sure your product is, is, is accessible and, and that your website's accessible and that your store is accessible for people. So that leads me to this story. So we, we started working the houseware show in Chicago. And uh, uh, Chicago, the houseware show is at the McCormick Center, which is a huge, you know, million square foot uh, convention center. And, and you take you know, booth space there and you're meeting with buyers and, and showing your, your product and, and trying to get it placed with the various retailers. And the show this year, uh, the year that I went, it, it overlapped my wife's birthday. And so I knew I had to get some kind of a gift for my wife. So after the show, I left the convention center and I walked down the Miracle Mile. And it had been in Chicago and down the Miracle Mile, the main big shopping street there. Beautiful street, isn't it? This girl has been there. And, and I walked past Tiffany's. And I said, Geez, do I look like the kind of person that I could walk into a Tiffany's? Is that accessible to me? But it was the place that was open. I said, I need to find my wife a gift. And... And, you know, normally, I mean, this is 15 or 20 years ago. I mean, I could walk in Tiffany's now and buy my wife something nice, but then I had to convince myself I could do that. So I walked into Tiffany's, and I was approached by a lovely woman, saleswoman, and I still remember her name. Her name was Beryl. And, and she said, how can I help you? Okay, she probably sized me up and says, you know, I'm not going to buy a $10,000 diamond, okay? But she was a great salesman. This is the best sales lesson I ever learned. And, and she says, how can I help you? And I said, you know, I'm, I'm here at the show, and I'm missing my wife's birthday. I need to find her a gift. You know what she asked me? She says, tell me about your wife. Okay? Okay right there. She made me think, okay? My wife's busy. We've got young kids. She's active. She's, you know, these things. She made me think, but she helped me solve my problem of getting a great gift. We went over to the counter. She pulled out some beautiful teardrop silver earrings and a little bracelet, something I'm sure that she knew I could afford. My wife wore them tonight just for this occasion. Okay? And it was a beautiful gift, and it came in that little blue box and the little blue bag, and guys, it was a home run. Not a base hit, it was a home run when I got home. <laughs> okay? The point is, though, 
Okay, she solved the problem. She asked the right questions and she solved the problem. And I learned something there. So it doesn't matter if you're sitting with the buyer at Al Sporting Goods or the buyer at Walmart. The only reason you're sitting there is that they have a problem. Okay, and you need to ask the right questions and if you'll solve that problem, you'll get your product on the floor. And, and now that you've got the internet, again, most of the time when I get on the internet, I'm trying to solve a problem. I need a new raincoat, I need a pair of shoes, I've got a broken part on my car, okay, I'm solving the problem. So there's a good lesson in that for everybody. Let's see what the next slide is. Maybe that'll help me. Okay. Here's another great quote, one of my favorites. The intuitive mind is a sacred gift, and the rational mind is a faithful servant. We have created a society that honors the servant and has forgotten the gift. Okay? Now, keep that in mind as we talk about four principles now. So one of the first classes that I had here at Utah State was from Professor Holdridge. He's retired now, but he taught uh, statics and mechanics and thermodynamics. And the first thing he taught us that he said, a good engineer will observe. He says, if you have good powers of observation, if you can see, you'll be a good problem solver. And, and this idea of observing and seeing is something that can be learned and something that can be developed and we can develop that skill. The idea of observing is using all of your senses, not just seeing and hearing, but tasting. If you can combine those things, you can develop this idea of seeing. Because some people just, you know, they, they see better. And so I, I want to just share a few things here with you with this concept. I mean, for example, I mean, there's lots of examples. I mean, most of the advances in medicine have come through observation. You know, a, a doctor seeing mold in a petri dish, uh, uh, a, another doctor, it's a great story of figuring out why, you know, a, a doctor who washed his hands had better patient outcomes than a doctor who didn't wash his hands. And observing that, years before they finally get a microscope and you can see all the bugs and the bacteria and stuff is there. But it's that, that making that observation, that connection, again, then, then pushes knowledge forward. I mean, all you guys out there, girls who like guns, the story of John M. Browning, you know, here in Utah, uh, his story of how he developed the automatic weapon. So he had lots of knowledge about guns, but the story, he's out shooting, and as he would shoot the, the bullet, he would see the concussion in a field of grass and how it would go forward and it would come back. And that's where he, this observation that he realized what was going on, it's called gas dynamics, okay, of that shell going off. He took that knowledge, that observation, and built the first fully automatic weapon. Now there's pluses and minuses to that, depending on which end of the gun you're at, okay? <laughs> but it came through the powers of observation. Um, and then just in business, just in Camp Chef, again, that, that observing what the market needs is, is again how you build a business. So I, I just, I, I really just want to emphasize of seeing. We've, we've got to look up from our cell phones, look up from your computers and look around at the world. And, and, and really see and observe. Okay, and if we can do that, I mean, we're, we'll just be more successful, you just understand more. So, so another example from, and, and kind of a funny story from uh, this, uh, the same trade show at, uh, in Chicago. Uh, there's probably a million square feet of marble flooring in, in this convention hall in Chicago. And in one of the big halls is they have all of the houseware things. So, Every conceivable thing to clean with is there. Every type of cleaner, every kind of, of uh, 
of uh, brush, you name it, is at this houseware show internationally. So I, I walked out into the hallway to take a break from our booth, kind of sat down, I think I had a drink, and I'm watching a, a couple of the cleaning ladies. They've got their carts, and they're over on the side. So I'm just kind of observing that, and I'm watching. And, and, uh, and this is really ironic. And so finally I see this, this gal, she takes a stick, a broomstick, out of her holder. And it's got a tennis ball stuck on the end of it. She takes it over there and she cleans the black marks off the, the marble flooring, puts it back in. And so they kind of made their way over there. And I walked over and talked to them. I says, tell me about your tool there. I mean, here we're at this trade show, the houseware show. Every conceivable cooking, I mean, cleaning device in the world is there, okay? And she says, oh, we've tried everything. The best thing to get scuff marks and stuff off these polished floors, you take a tennis ball, you score it with a knife, you shove it on an old broomstick, and you clean the scuff marks off. See, great story, see? Um, you know, an absor absor what to do with that. So two lessons there. One, I mean, again, how to solve a problem, but two... Let's make sure as we climb the ladder, we observe the people below us. You know, pay attention to the people who are cleaning the floors, the people who, are, who are, are, again, part of our economy, part of our society. You guys are on the upward ladder here. That's the whole purpose of, of, of coming to school and you're seeking this mutual, you're competitive, but you're in a mutually beneficial relationship with the university and the university is investing in you, and the state is investing in the university so that hopefully you'll become model citizens, you'll be working, you'll be building businesses, you'll be paying taxes. That's the mutually beneficial relationship that you enter into when you pay your tuition and you come to school. But again, as you go through that ladder, observe, watch the people who are a little bit below you. Okay. Let's do the next thing here. All right, this is the lesson that I've tried to teach my kids for years. So four things. Observe. Look around. See what's going on. Two, think. Think about those things. Ponder on those things. Process that information. Right? Yeah, and there's some experience that comes in with this. But you think. Okay, secondly, decide. Third, I'm going to decide. Make a decision, right? Sometimes you worry about, you know, you're changing your majors, you're doing things. Some things like that, it just doesn't matter. Decide, make a decision. Then after you make the decision, then you act. I mean, you've all heard the thing, you know, uh, you know ready, aim, fire. The problem with most of us is we fire, then we get ready, and then we aim. Well, this is just kind of a mantra to, to help us do that. So observe, think, decide, then act, and then use that as a feedback loop. And, you know, and I, I could give you lots of examples of that, you know, both in industry and in life and, and in our own business. Again, taking that information. But again, I don't, there's nothing, you know, uh, marvelous about this. It's just a simple mantra that, that we can teach ourselves and that we can get better at. So with, with this, and, and again, one of the last stories I want to share with you is, is about hard decisions and about how this can help us uh, make better decisions. So I brought up before this, this uh, uh, economic change that we've had of this global sourcing. Now, when we started Camp Chef, we were doing 95% of the manufacturing here. We were importing about 5% of our parts. Now, over time, we started importing, you know, a, a greater percentage of that, and maybe it was 90-10. And, and my goal was to always have a manufacturing and be a U.S.-based manufacturer and combine that manufacturing base, you know, with importing the, cut, the right parts and pieces. Well, by about 1998, our business had grown, and at this point, we were selling national chains like Costco and Sam's. And so I was doing uh, annual meetings with uh, Sam's uh, uh, and their sporting goods buyers and put together a, a new program for them. 
and flew out to Bentonville. And, and at that time, even like now, I mean, Sam's and Walmart, they're saying, we want to work with U.S. made manufacturers. Uh, uh, we want to continue to grow that business. But again, but they're under pressures as well to lower costs. And, and at that time, things are moving pretty fast in this offshoring world. So literally, I mean, I fly out to Bentonville, go meet the buyer at the Sam's buying offices, uh, walk under a sign that says, you know, we support U.S. manufacturers. I walk in, I sit down with the buyer, uh, present the uh, uh, upcoming lineup of products. We'd had a successful season and, you know, finished with the fact that we were doing everything we can to lower our costs. Uh, we were importing some things, but we were committed to keeping our manufacturing as much as we could here in the U.S. Okay, do you know what the buyer told me? He looked across the table and he says, Ty, I'm buying about 30 items in my category and only two of them are still made in the U.S. Golf balls and your stoves. Okay? And he says, the golf balls are going to China in two months. And he said, I know there's about 20 to 25% cost reductions in your stoves if I can buy them factory direct from China if you don't sell them to me, I'll go to your competitors and they will. Well, that's a pretty hard uh, sign to miss or to observe there. So I did a lot of thinking on the airplane home, sat down as a group and we had to make some hard decisions and then we had to act. Now, these are the forces that are playing out in our society right now and, and in our economy right now. So within the next 10 years to about 2005, we saw those numbers shift. We continued to uh, uh, do as much manufacturing here as we could, but by 2005, our business to be competitive, to continue to grow, had shifted to a design, market, warehouse, and sell business, and working with our partners and factories in Asia to build our product and bring it in as finished goods. And this is where my relationship with my friend Joseph Liu helped to set those factories up. And, and we did that to service the Walmarts of the world, the Cabela's of the world, and, and this global supply chain, that those products, you know, came directly from the factories, went into the containers, came right to the stores, again, to reduce the cost, and so that instead of that stove costing $149, it cost $119. And that's what drove the, the, literally the economy in those years. Now, are there winners and losers? Yes. You know, I still think that was the decision that we had to make, and, and you know, to, to grow our business. So those are the types of hard decisions that anybody who's doing business is going to have to make. And, and again, we see those decisions playing out right now you know, in our political and economic uh, uh, system and in our society. And some jobs are going to come back. We're just telling you that but we need to continue to embrace this idea of, of a global economy. I mean, just for you guys, the, 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 the numbers, I looked these up before I came in. I, I think it's like 80% of the growth over the next five years, growth, you know, will be, you know, outside of the United States. So we've got to figure out a way to make it mutually beneficial. And, and I, I, I'm going to hold out uh, uh, confidence that we've got an administration that can do that, whether it's trade deals, whether it's, Again, our relationship with other nations, that those can be mutually beneficial and it can continue to benefit our, our, our country. Let's see. How are we coming? We want to have some questions. Um, let me kind of wrap up then. So let me, let me just finish again with you good young people. 
what's the most important, mutually beneficial relationship that I've ever had? Well, it's been with my wife. Without her support, without her strength, without her encouragement, I wouldn't have been able to accomplish the things that I've been able to do. So for you young people, especially you young men, okay? Look, observe, think, <laughs> decide, act. Look at all these lovely young ladies out here. So you've got no excuse, right? There's your formula to find that. And, and, and again, my dad's line was that I learned from my dad, and he said to, to uh, me and my brothers, you'll never accumulate anything of value until you get married. So. Okay. One last quote, and then we'll answer some questions. And this is the, this is the uh, philosophical, the, whoops, the philosophical part of this. Okay? And you'll have to think about this, and maybe you can get copies. Let's read it. How is one to live a moral and compassionate existence when one is fully aware of the blood, the horror inherent in life, when one finds darkness not only in one's culture but within oneself. If there is a stage at which an individual life becomes truly adult, and you guys are here and you're learning how to be adults, it must be when one grasps the irony in its unfolding and accepts responsibility for a life lived in the midst of such paradox. One must live in the middle of contradiction, because if all contradiction were eliminated at once, life would collapse. There are simply no answers to some of the great pressing questions. You continue to live them out, making your life a worthy expression of leaning into the light. See, and I've always loved that quote. And be reading good books by people like this Barry Lopez, one of our great uh, uh, you know, outdoor and and uh, environmental writers in the country. And so when I think about this, this global economy that we've created and winners and losers and these paradoxes and the hard decisions that we make in business and about where we do business and how we do it, We have to make hard decisions. And, you know, so one of the ways that I think about, you know, the fact that we've had to offshore product and, and uh, is you know, we have been a part of probably the, the biggest economic change the world has ever known. The growth of the economies across the Asian nations has lifted more people out of poverty, lifted more people out of a dollar or two dollar day existence than anything that's ever been done in human history. And I think it's important and a great thing to be a part of that. And I think that as a people, and as a nation, that we can participate, you know, in the world economy, in a global economy, and, and raise all boats. And I think it's important that we do that. And so I want you guys to know that you need to go out and, and realize maybe there aren't answers to all the questions. But be a worthy expression of leaning into the light. And you'll find satisfaction. You'll find uh, growth, and you'll find personal benefit if you'll do that. So thanks for being patient and uh, listening to my story tonight, and uh, I appreciate that. So I'll take some questions then. Right here, blue shirt. Um, have you People always get burned. 
Yeah, no, so that, that's why you have liability insurance. We spend a lot of money on liability insurance. Okay, question gets a hat. There you go. I have a question right here. What have been some of your most, what have been some of the most influential books that you have read? No, say that again. What have been some of the most influential books that you have read? Oh, books. Yes. But you know, if I were you guys, the books like I read are history. I read everything that, say, Simon Winchester writes, David McCullough writes. I love Barry Lopez's stuff. I mean, uh, uh, you know, I mean, if, if anybody wants to learn about organization, I mean, read Shackleton's Endurance. If you don't know who Shackleton is, look it up. You know, but one of the, again, one of the great organizational books in the world is, is Ernest Shackleton and, and Endurance and Keeping Those Men Alive and Going There. Read those, those are the kind of books that I read. I have a question here. Yeah. Um, so your company recently sold to Vista Outdoor. Yes. What is your current role still in the company, and have you seen benefits from that purchase? Well, um, I mean, current role is, is I'm just maintaining my position, and I'll do that for uh, probably 12 months, and then after that, I'll continue to work for the business, but I'll probably step back from some things, continue to do product development, and, and, and do some sales, and, and continue to work probably for the next, uh, uh, you know, 18 months or so. I mean, I'll maintain some role in the business, and... Uh, really, I mean, there's been a lot of consolidation in the outdoor industry, and I felt like it was a good time to, to sell the business, uh, get on a bigger boat, and, and also to give the people who work for me a, a, a more opportunity to grow in a bigger organization. And, and again, you see a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, consolidation in our business, and sometimes it, it is a little bit better to be bigger. I mean, it's... It's when you're, when you're, there's a place in between being small and being big. I mean, you're, you're too big to be small and you're too small to be big. And so, you know, remember that as you grow your businesses. Okay, right here, this young lady. Here's a hat for you for asking a question. Right there. Yeah. Yes. Yep. Well, we we we've we've both invested and, and been part of the, the factories that that we uh, you know source from, and and we made it a practice to use you know smaller companies or smaller factories that that we would have more control over. So we've always sourced direct. I have a number of Chinese speakers who have worked for me over the years. And so we've worked with smaller factories uh, instead of the huge multinationals. I mean, the, the size of factories that are building iPhones, you know, with tens of thousands of, of employees. We always worked with smaller companies uh, that we could, you know, maintain as, get as much control as we could. And, and people need to realize, I mean, there's, there's to do business with, I mean, we have at least two audits a year just to sell product to Costco that they have inspectors their own going into the factories now all the time. You know, so you need to be following the rules of the road or you're, you're just not staying in business. So a lot of that has cleaned up you know, over the years. But you know, in the early 90s and things, yeah, there was a lot of abuses. But I mean, but, but that's, that's what an ec economic revolution looks like. Right here. That's why we don't have child labor in this country anymore because of the Industrial Revolution in the, you know, the 17 and 1800s. Have you had any issues with uh, quality coming out of those countries versus the United States, especially early on, because now we might have yeah. more yeah. regulation within the process? Well, well, starting out, I mean, it, it, again, guys, it, it doesn't, remember this, it doesn't matter what country you're in. If you put garbage in, you get garbage out. See, the idea that, that uh, oh, if it's made in U.S., it's good. Well, no, it, it's only good if, if it's made well. It doesn't matter where you make it. You know, so you work hard to put in controls. Maybe some of you guys are in the management program or in, in quality programs. You get out what you put in. And so we invested a lot in working with the factories, setting those standards. And, and when you do that, you grow with those businesses. And, and again, you get the quality that you invest in. Doesn't matter where you build it, but, but you make sure that you can manage your product and 
and uh, uh, you'll get the quality that you expect. So, yes, right here. Um, so with the uh, emergence of social media and sales online, have you seen a lot of shift with sales coming from online websites or like Amazon, or has it yes, maintained great, in the Yes, great, stores? great question. Part of my, I, I, that, I, that I had in my presentation was to talk about that. So the, the first huge shift that, that we saw and we participated in was this, again, this global sourcing. And the second one has been the rise of the internet and internet, um, uh, call it internet sales or social media. Now, and, and, and I talked with the, the young people after, you know, before we had dinner, is that, is that can, you guys, can you imagine sitting around in a meeting like we did in the early 90s saying, well, should we buy our domain name? What does that mean? <laughs> You know, or, or, or asking the questions, well, well, do you think Amazon can sell something other than books? You know, should we, should we make them an account and be part of that? But see, but those are the kind of decisions. And, and again, this, this process of observing. I mean, trying to look down the, the, the pipeline enough that you could see where that's going. And, and as a business, thank heavens uh, that, that we made a, a couple of good decisions there. In, in seeing, well, we think there's something there. And so we not only set up campchef.com, but we set up our own web store called outdoorcooking.com. So many of you maybe don't know that, or you don't know that it's owned by Camp Chef. And we did that, you know, a lot of years ago, just so that we could compete and control our pricing, you know, with the Amazons of the world. So now that's one of the fastest growing parts of our business is, is our own website. But, but again, again, we are continue to see double-digit growth with Amazon, with, you know, the other key, you know, web sellers in our category. So that's just a huge part of the business. This, this we call it the direct-to-consumer or the DTC business. And, and, and really, that's the, that's the, again, the mutually beneficial relationship that's overtaking retail right now. And you see it, what, I mean, what is Uber or Lyft other than just an individual who has a car, who's driving to Salt Lake, and can meet somebody and give them a ride down there? Okay, that's just a mutually beneficial relationship based on social media. You know, now take that idea and translate that out literally to the world, and, and really, and that'll be the next great step. I mean, it's, it's see, the, the traditional retailing, we use the retailer as our face to the consumer. Okay? I, I go to a trade show, I sell the product to Al Sporting Goods, Al Sporting Goods puts it on their floor, and their salespeople sell it to the consumer. Well, that model's been turned completely upside down. And, and companies who have not invested in and figured out how to speak directly to that consumer to give them a, a, a mutually beneficial experience with content, with, for us, with recipes, with, with uh, uh, exciting ways to use our products, you know, we're going to lose that customer. And so, again, you guys are on the cusp of the next great, you know, revolution, you know, in the economy. So observe, think, decide, and act, you know, and, and, and just learn right now, make that a part you know, of your thinking with anything you're doing with business. We have time for one more question up there. Um, what is your proudest moment in, like, the making of Camp Chef? My proudest moment. <laughs> it's like asking me which of my children I like best. <laughs> um... Oh, that's a hard question. And I, I, you know, I don't know. Probably, I'll, I'll tell you, probably the proudest moment is, isn't one. It's probably maybe um, 15, you know, 15 years into the business, maybe just five years ago, 20 years into the business, when the realization that you had finally built a brand and, and it had staying power and it had resonance and that it wasn't going away. Does, does that make sense? And, and so that's probably one of the, the, one of the proudest moments, and, and to take time to think about that, and that you had finally achieved that. 
And so again, and just close. So you guys need to remember that. It's, it's, there's this kind of this idea with this internet age and our smartphones that all I have to do is come up with an app and give it a snappy name and, and uh, you know, I've got a business. I mean, I'm, I'm still a believer that it takes years to build a brand and to really build that resonance, you know, with a customer. And, and that's the, the, the joy of business is in building that, you know, and building the value in it and, and then seeing that brand or that idea, you know, be uh, positive in people's lives. So anyway, that's it. Excellent. Okay.